following interview was conducted uh, with Robert C. Kriebel, a retired editor of the Journal Courier for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, March 31st, 2009 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Mr. Kriebel, and good afternoon to you. Well, thank you very much. I'm very honored and surprised to be invited to, involved in, to be involved in this thing because I'm sort of attracted to Purdue, and I'm sort of connected with Purdue, but I'm sort of not. <laughs> I didn't go to Purdue. I didn't okay. get a Purdue degree. Your colleague. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in oh, the early years. I came from IU country, Bedford, Indiana, down in Lawrence County, but moved up here at the age of 11 to, to uh, Purdue in 1943 when my father, Ralph Kriebel, became an extension agent in the School of Agriculture. So that's where your affiliation started. That's you where got. the affiliation started. We lived on South Grant about a block from the Purdue campus. And uh, I've been a very much of a Purdue uh, observer ever since. Five of our children end up going to Purdue. They have uh, four undergraduate degrees and two uh, advanced degrees at Purdue. So I have very much about Purdue. Yeah. Where'd you go to, to grade school? Tell us about grade school. I went school. to a grade school up here in Morton Elementary over in West Lafayette. And, uh, I shouldn't say over in West Lafayette because we're in West Lafayette. Right. Then I went to West Lafayette High School, okay. graduated in 1950. Was it at the same the spot where it is today there on Grant Street? Yes. Okay. Any student activities? Or it's what about was three school? times bigger than it was when I was a kid over there. We had like 68 or 72 in our senior class. That's dwarfs. Uh, what, it, was what only, they had. it was only four years at that time? Just, yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, I was involved in the National Honor Society and things like that. I played basketball and football. I got a scholarship to play basketball at Tulane University down in New Orleans, Louisiana. And that's what got me out of town for about four years. How did the scholarship come about? Well, I played basketball at Westside and was on the Indiana All-Star team as an alternate and uh, had some considerable interest in uh, recruiters who were looking for basketball talent. There were a couple of football teams looking for me, but mostly basketball. In those days, I was about six feet four and weighed, well, between 180 and 220 pounds over the years. But I was a fair size and played center back in those days. I was a pretty good sized basketball player. Not anymore, if you notice. So you played from uh, 52 to 54. How did the team do down to At Tulane, it did fairly well. Uh, it was nothing like the scale that we have of college basketball today, where there's 64 teams in the NCAA tournament and so on. It's nothing to compare. Yeah, tell us a little bit about, I mean, did, were there state things? What were the comparable? What sort of tournaments did they have? For the oh, teams? they had uh, all-star tournaments, and then they had uh, holiday tournaments at Christmas time and at New Year's. I played in a couple of those over the years. Uh, and in the postseason, there was the National Invitation Tourney, or the NIT, which is still popularly called. But the... NCAA was done very differently from what it is now. There were only that, like it existed at that time. Yeah, right? there were only 16 or 18 or 20 or 24 teams invited, and uh, they fought it out. But now they have 64 to start with, and it's become a real national event, as sure. we all know. Right, and NIT is part of them too now. NIT NCAA. is separate, but it's running at about the same NCAA. time in March. And a bunch of players and teams that don't make the big NCAA tourney do make the NIT as right. invitations. Yeah. What was campus life like down there, and uh, what was your course of study? I majored in journalism down at Tulane University and had one wonderful teacher. And I've often said over the years, one good teacher is all it takes to get you really fired up and interested in what you're doing. He's still living. Here we are talking in the year 2009, and he's 94 years old. Of course, he's retired, but I Do get a chance. you still keep in touch? Still, yeah, we right. exchange a letter or two now and then, and uh, we go to New Orleans once about once a year, and we visit with him and some others who are friends from our days down there, but that's long ago and far away. What was New Orleans like at that time? New Orleans was a fascinating place, you know. I've often said when I made a recruiting visit down there, I was impressed by the palm trees. And things like that is what impresses you when you're 17 or 18 years old. Now you go down there and you see as much tornado wreckage as you do anything else. The French Quarter was a fascinating place. I was not 
fascinated much by it. I am more now than I was then, I guess you could say. Such a, such a melting pot of cultures and races and backgrounds and nationalities be pretty hard to duplicate from what it was back in those days, but very little of it is the same. That's right, yeah. Uh, what ha then what year did you graduate and then what came next? I graduated in 1954. In those days, there was great obligation for young men to spend time in the military. Okay. You might get drafted for a couple of years, or <clears throat> if you wanted to stay in college for the um, duration of a, of a college education, you almost were obliged to take one of the ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps programs from the Navy, the Air Force, or the Army. I was an Army ROTC grad. And from, obligated, from uh, yes, and obligated to serve two years of, of uh, active duty. I went on active duty early in 55 and got out early in 57. That was enough. Where did of, you serve? What, what, of the yeah. military. Her was what? Where did you serve while you were there? Well, was I was the in uh, was, Baltimore, was Maryland, and Atlanta, Georgia okay. for the whole two years. Okay. I, I, the Korean I, War was over by then. The Korean War was coming on. I'm trying to think. No, you're right. It was all over. Yeah, it was over. Right. Anyway, I was in peacetime duty in Georgia, <laughs> and I was involved in the Counterintelligence Corps, which was a kind of an elitist group. You had to have certain educational background and certain other requirements in order to get in it. And so I just simply, you could make light of military service back in those days. It was the Eisenhower years. And I used to say, well, I helped catch spies in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, uh, you can't laugh much about that anymore. We've had too many bitter times Since in too then. many different places. Sure. Okay. After you got out of the service, what's your career path before you came back to Lafayette and the Journal Courier? Not much of one. I came back to Lafayette and went to work for a little paper across the river called the Lafayette Leader, which is barely in business at all now, like a lot of papers which are struggling. But I was able to work for a couple of months, June, July, part of August of 1950 five and got a job at the Journal and Courier on the strength of some of the writing I had done there. Started at the Journal and Courier uh, in the middle 50s and stayed until I retired at the end of 93. Okay. So I almost put in 40 years, not quite. Was it located in the same spot that it's now? Not not the new plant, but the one downtown? That had, uh, the where the, the plant are. that I worked in is still down there, 6th and Ferry Street. The editorial offices are there, the advertising department and so on. The production matters, that is to say the press and the distribution movement has been taken outside town to another. I'm trying to think. I think it's on 500 or 550 East. And I've been in it quite a few times as a tour guide of all things. And we take school groups and retiree groups and whatnot. And uh, it's been fun, but I've, I'm really drifting slowly away from it. Right. What was, the, uh, what was your responsibilities and some of the positions you had there? And also the impact of technology, how that changed? Well, the technology has changed from the old mechanical typewriter and gravitated into the electric typewriter and now into the uh, what you call the PC or the personal computer. You write your stories on a computer. I remember when Purdue won the women's NCAA basketball title in 99. I was already retired. My daughter Carol, uh, our daughter Carol is a managing editor of the Journal Courier at the time. And Purdue won the game playing, I think, in San Jose. Does that sound right? San Jose, California. And, the, geez, the game didn't get over with till like midnight or 12 o'clock, 1230, somewhere like that. And I knew that the press ran about 1130 or 12 at night. So how's a journal courier ever going to get a story or anything about that game in the, unless they hold the press? By golly, our paper came. I was retired now, don't forget. Our paper came the next morning. There was a story maybe two stories and two or three pictures from the game already in the paper. And I said to our daughter, Carol, how in the world do you get that stuff without holding the press? She said, Dad, all we do now is send it by email. Said you put your picture into a machine, you hit a couple of keys, and it emails it out here. It takes about eight seconds. So I say technology is a marvelous thing. 
sometimes I wonder if it doesn't, uh, isn't almost too marvelous. The, the things that I see in newspapers today have very little to do with news sometimes, it seems to me. This is a, here's a grumpy old man complaining to you. But it's so easy to tell the stories that I think people are doing too much technology and not enough storytelling. What were your positions at, at Well, the I started out as a kid reporter when I was a kid okay. and began to be a uh, specialist in the field of politics for a long time. What, wrote, state and local as well? I wrote local and state politics and covered a couple of national conventions for our newspaper. One in, uh, I'm trying to remember back, one was in Washington and one, I think, was in Atlantic City. At any rate, boy, this is a long time ago. You've got to remember that. Then I moved up to... Uh, city editor, which means you're in charge of gathering the, and running the staff that collects the local news. They cover the courts and the police stations and the council meetings and things of that sort. And after that, I became the managing editor where you're in charge of sports and you're in charge of local and in charge of the so-called lifestyle section, whatever you want to call it. And uh, you just simply run the whole news department. That was a big job. I had that for about 10 or 15 years. Has a budget of over a million bucks, is much over more than that now. And I had a staff of 40 some to, to take care of and watch out for and discipline when necessary and so on. So it was a variety of different responsibilities as the years went on. I ran the editorial page as a one man operation toward the end of my career when younger people were moving up and taking over some of the jobs that I had held before. Uh, John McCutcheon did the editorial page at the, the son, not, not the, the son of the cartoonist for the Tribune. He sure did. Yeah. Um, talk about, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, your weekly column, Old Lafayette. Did that start while you were with the Journal Courier? Yes, or? it started in, uh, I guess the official start must have been about the middle of December 1977. Okay. So it's in its 32nd year now, and you do the math, 32 times 52 issues a year means that more than 1,500 of them have been in print. And I remember at the time I started how that. Did you, how did it come about? How did you think about doing that? I began to see that, gosh, there are a lot of wonderful stories about Tippecanoe County and Lafayette's history that have not been told and have never been told. And why don't I do that? Nobody else is doing it. And I told my publisher at the time, Mal Applegate was involved at that time. I said, Mal, you know, I think there are enough good ideas on local history that I'll bet you I could do 500 of these. Well, I've done three times that many now, and it's not an I, 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 me, me, me thing with me. I just enjoy telling the stories. I try to, like, unlike maybe a lot of the modern columnists, I try to just tell the story and stay the heck out of it. I don't have any role to play in this. I'm just telling you some stories. The storyteller only. But I see so many, many people writing columns nowadays who are what I call I, 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 me, me, me columns, where the opening line will say, my dog was wet. And you, know, and you got to They pick, jump right in. Yeah, I jump right into it and take a part in the story. I would never do that. And that goes back to that 94-year-old fellow that I learned from way back in New Orleans, back in the 1950s. And he essentially, to paint a word picture that almost any reporter could understand, would say, look, maybe you're the MC up on the stage and you have the microphone in your hand and you've got somebody to interview, but you give them the microphone and you stay the heck out of it because they have the story to tell. And they've got the mic. And they've got the mic. And, but I don't see as much of that as I used to. I don't okay. think that reporting of news has has stayed where I used to remember it. Yeah. The other thing that I want to ask you about is a couple things. You did some teaching at Purdue and professional advisor to the Exponent. How did that come The about? Exponent story was very interesting. It was 1970 and 71. The paper had a, a rather rebellious young editor whose name was Bill Smoot, and he had a staff that kind of followed his advice in many, many ways, and he was publishing things that were very, what shall I say, questionable in terms of taste, in terms of intent, 
and advertisers began to drop away from the exponent. Several would say, well, if you're going to print that stuff, we're not going to advertise with you. Well, that's pretty tough for They a need the ads because it's free. And they free. need it. And so efforts were made by people who were for the exponent to try to get advertisers to change their mind. They say, change the tone of that paper and let's get the advertisers back. There were other people who were in it to try to get the exponent destroyed. And some of them were people in high places here on the campus in which they exerted a little exponent or a little, a little of their influence on the outside to get advertisers to drop the exponent and get away from it. Let's bury this thing and start over. So the editorial board that was made mostly of faculty, as I recall it, was pretty much mandated by the administration here at Purdue, hire a professional advisor who can come down here when you're putting out the paper every night and review. Don't have to edit it. You don't have to change the intent of it, but at least review what you're doing and try to involve a sense of uh, proportion to this a stuff. balance. Yeah, that's what I was advised to do for a while. And so I became very friendly with the exponent staff. And it was a learning experience for me in the sense that I learned once and for all that talent doesn't have any great bounds. We had some wonderful writers on that staff who were not journalism majors. Because wonderful, Purdue was not to have a journalism school. Yeah, they were not in. They were not in broadcast journalism. They weren't in advertising. They weren't in anything. They just, by gosh, knew how to write. One of them was a. I think he was a mechanical engineering major, and he was just a marvelous writer. I've been made friends with several of those folks, and actually hired about a half a dozen of them over a couple of years to come to the Journal Courier and uh, see what it's like in the, in the so-called real world over there. One was a photographer, was with our paper for years. Another one was uh, a uh, managing editor who became very big in the Gannett Company, which owns the Journal and Courier, and he's right now still living and still working. I think out in, uh, in the state of Utah, and he's in the circulation department. But the point is, the talent was there. I hired Judy Horak, who was one of our great uh, business writers at the Journal Courier for a while. I hired three or four others from the Exponent staff, and that was a great revelation to me, the fact you don't have to go to journalism school, and you don't have to get a Ph.D. Pardon me for saying so. You don't have to get a master's. You don't even have to have a journalism degree to be good at what you're doing. And so, Don't have a talent. For yeah, that. and that, that just that was a great thing I should have learned when I was in my twenties, and I didn't <laughs> learn them until I was about in my sixties. But those are the kinds of things. That's why the exponent had a professional advisor for a year. It seemed to help a little bit. One of the great things that this young staff did on the exponent, not so much under my direction, just under my watchful eye, maybe is the right word. There was a great agitation going on in the campus. Who is going to be the next Purdue president? It, was, it must have been when Hovde was stepping down. President right? Hovde was stepping down, and the speculation ran wild, as it always does, <laughs> whether you're hiring a, a professor of English or a basketball coach or what it is, who's going to get the job? The exponent staff, through really hard work, found out that it was Arthur Hansen and broke the story ahead of all the other papers that I remember. And I thought, uh-oh, they're going to get it before the Journal Courier gets it. And here I am, the managing editor of the JNC. What do I do? And I got to think and let them have the story. They've earned it. Well, that was, that was the end of the uh, school year, pretty much, the end of my career as an exponent advisor. But it was very helpful and very profitable, and I hope helped a lot of the young people. And yes. interestingly... During 20, 000, uh, 2008, while Sarah Palin was running for vice president and was a fixture up as the governor of Alaska, there was one of the young people on the exponent board who was then managing an Alaska newspaper up in Anchorage, knew her, and provided some marvelous stuff for the wire services and for the broadcast media about Sarah Palin giving background information and so on. So the beauty of... of running a staff like that and being an advisor for a staff like that you're a teacher you see it yourself it multiplies 
all the people that you knew as kids go on to better things. And boy, what a great... You gave them a start and they moved on. What a great rewarding experience that is for an old timer. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing you mentioned, I did teach as a part-time visiting instructor, I think was the correct title of it, in uh, Journalism 252, that's a 200 level course, and Journalism 451, which is a senior or graduate level course in the School of Communication. It was just called journalism, that's all it was. I taught reporting, editing, writing, things like interviewing, and so forth, other skills that you need to learn. And uh, I started out with 15 students in my class. The first year in the fall Was of it a two semester or just one semester? One semester. Started in the fall of 78, and it went for 10 semesters. You do the math, that adds up through the spring of 82. But by the spring of 82, there were 26 in the class, and man, that got to be a big job. You're a teacher, and you can appreciate yeah, that fact. Right. Man, oh, man. I thought the best way to teach journalism was to give the students a lot of practical exercises, things they could write about. We'd pick subjects and say, let's see how you do when you describe a building. Let's see how you do when you interview a person. Let's see how you do when you uh, have a horrible accident. And, and, and just throw these story out, story ideas out, and then... The students would turn them back, and I was very critical about them making deadlines. I don't think that's preached enough in school, the importance of the discipline of writing fast and getting your stories in the paper. At the deadline. And then, after it's been turned in, get the results back to the students as fast as you can. Don't wait five weeks before you get those papers back. Do it Monday or do it Saturday or something like that. Well, I worked awfully hard to get that done, especially when the class got to be 26. And I thought, boy, here's another lesson for old Bob. I learned what it's like to be a teacher, and it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> and I have a huge respect for good teachers. And uh, there are not, never enough good teachers. But those are the things that I learned in my working life and in my teaching life. Yeah, that's good. Now let's talk a little bit about you as an author, some of the books that you've done and what you've got going at the moment. How when you I was younger, when I'm going to say when I was, let's say, 50, still working at the newspaper, the idea of writing a book seemed impossible. Uh, you write news stories, those might run a thousand words, not much more than a thousand, on your best day. A lot of your stories would run 300 or 400 or 500. And I remember back as a kid when we used to have to write a 500-word theme. And I thought, oh, God, that's going to take forever. But the longer I worked as a newspaper man and found out that you can write pretty quickly. And electric typewriters make it a little faster if you can think fast enough. That writing a book doesn't seem that hard to do anymore. But I used to preach this to my students at school when I was at Purdue and in the Journal and Courier when we're in the news business. There are three basic parts of writing a good story. And can you guess what they are? And usually can't. I say the first one is, number one, get a good idea. Get a good story to write. And that's so much harder than it looks. Number two, Get your facts straight. That's the whole area of research. How do you research? You read, you interview, and get information from another person. And finally, you use your personal observations. It was a sunny day, or it was a cloudy night, or it was a storm, or, you know, because you've been there and you've seen it. And that's the danger of what I mentioned a while ago. There are too many I, 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 me, me, me reporters now who put that first. I don't care what the idea is. I don't care about the research. I think this, I think this, I think this. Well, anyway, that's what I began to preach to other writers. And the longer I thought about it, you know, the same thing's true in writing a book. You got to start out with a good idea or forget it. If you don't have a good idea, you don't have anything. There's nowhere to go with it. No. And so uh, I got an idea one time that, boy, the Journal and Courier 
hasn't got the facilities or the or the uh, anything the mechanisms to handle a book but maybe I could do a book for somebody and get it published somewhere <clears throat> the closest thing to where I lived was Purdue University Press and my beloved friend Verna Emery took an interest in my idea it has to start out with an idea I said I got an idea for a book you might be interested in at Purdue Press about a woman from here in Lafayette named Helen Gauger who was a editor, a writer, a public speaker, and an author. And she was a person who fought for woman suffrage in the days when not very many other people did. She fought for women's rights under the law at a time when not very many other people did. She fought for ends to substance abuse, not just drugs, but mostly but just alcohol. Demon rum. She fought to fight it to stop all that stuff in her day. Well, she died in 1907, way too early to ever enjoy woman suffrage in 1920 or any of the other things. But it did make a fairly good book. And I thought that is an idea I ought to try to run with. Verna Emery was very encouraging. She thought that would make an unusual book too. You gotta have encouragement. You got to have that second or third opinion behind you where people say, yeah, I agree. I'd give it a shot. Verna Emery provided that, that thing that writers, when they're starting out especially, need so much. Oh, what a, a difference it makes when right. somebody gives you the backing. All right. Now, you talk <clears throat> press, but prior to that, wasn't, it, wasn't it, there used to be Purdue University Studies or Purdue Studies or something? I think it did way yeah, back early. Way back early yeah. because there, so they, uh, I don't the book know on this engineering uh, used that. I don't know when that changed. Yeah. But in the 60s and 50s, probably, this is what it but was. But in doing that book, I thought, I'm going to write the book and see what it suggests in the way of a title and see what it suggests in the way of chapters and so on and came up with a, a formula that I hadn't seen used much before in which hymns from great churches were used as chapter titles and the title of the book ended up being where the saints have trod which is a line from the old old uh, war horse hymn Onward Christian Soldiers. And uh, that became the title of the book, Where the Saints Have Trod, and Purdue Press published it. <coughs> I think it was a modest success, but er Verna Emery was so uh, popular about it. Was she the person in charge at that time down there? She was okay. uh, the editor. editor. Okay. She edited the book. She was getting near retirement. <coughs> but Verna was a very important helper for me. And I began to think about, gee, I'm going to retire from the Journal Courier before long, and I'd love to just spend years of retirement trying to do books. But they aren't all good books. they got to start with a good idea. And the next idea that I thought might work, when I pitched the idea to Verna and the others at Purdue Press, was to do a book, a factual book. These are nonfiction. They're not novels. They're nonfiction pieces about an interesting family from here in Lafayette, the Stein family, S-T-E-I-N. The father would be John Stein, who's a local attorney and secretary of the Board of Trustees at Purdue. When Purdue was starting out in the 1870s, his wife was Virginia Tomlinson Stein, a very literary person who ended up being Lafayette's public librarian for about 40 years. The daughter in the family was Eveline Stein, who was an artist and a poet. The son in the family was Orth Stein, who was a whole bunch of things. He was a brilliant writer, a brilliant poet, a brilliant cartoonist or illustrator, and also a white-collar criminal of great note who was wanted from coast to coast. And I thought, what a book this could be if I could get it all put together. And I did so. And in that case, instead of trying a religious theme for it, I borrowed from some other titles that I had enjoyed watching. 
and giving each of the characters in this family a title when it was called poets, painters, paupers, fools. And that appealed to me as a title of some note. The poet was Eveline Stein, the painter was Orth, the uh, pauper was the Stein family parents after Orth had gone off with most of their money, and the fool was Orth, who just blew everything he ever had in the way of talent. So Poets, Painters, Paupers, Fools became the second book in that series. came out about 1988, something like that. And Purdue Press, once again, uh, published it. And one of the central figures, John Stein, was one of the great people in the Purdue University history. And some others at Purdue, um, roles changed, editors changed, executive directors of the Purdue Press changed, different personalities come aboard, and <clears throat> you don't know how you're going to make out. You're running low on ideas, and you began to think, uh, i got to come up with something better than this. Until I noticed that John Purdue had been born in 1802. And I thought, whoa, the 200th anniversary of his birth is coming in 2002. Maybe I could get together some kind of a book about John Purdue that Purdue Unipre University Press would enjoy and have it ready for the year 2002. Well, I was pretty lucky. I started writing that book in about March of Oh, one, and I think I finished it in the fall of 01. It didn't take that long to do, but the, John, the story of John Perdue uh, surprised me at all the stuff that was available right here, but unpublished. Nobody seemed to know much about John Perdue other than the fact that he was a rich old merchant. And there were some other caustic remarks about John Perdue and his personality and all the rest of it. Bob Topping, the wonderful Bob Topping, writer of the Purdue history in 1988, said John Purdue had an ego as wide as the Wabash River. And so you find a lot of comments like that over the period. John Purdue did have a great ego. And Harvey Wiley met him before he died, Harvey Wiley being a very well-known member of the Purdue faculty in the 1870s, he said John Purdue was one of those people who believed he was right on every issue that came up. <laughs> and he had an ego like a child and so on. So John Purdue was certainly an imperfect, a flawed individual if there ever was one, and yet look what he gave the university. Look what he did to establish this unbelievable place. So I thought that would be a pretty good idea, and I ran with that. And Purdue Press printed that in the year 2002, and we called that. <laughs> I got a funny anecdote about that. I called him the something of the Wabash. Midas. Midas, the Midas of, of the, the Wabash. Midas, M-I-D-A-S, being a uh, character out of mythology who is said to have touched something and it would turn to gold. Well, John Purdue was a little that way. He came enormously wealthy as a merchant here in Lafayette. And he was very interested in education. He was a former school teacher as a very young man over in Ohio and so on. And he, he, he put up the money and started the first 100 acres of land and $150,000 over a 10-year period to establish. But typical of his big, wide uh, ego, he wanted it named Purdue University in perpetuity. I had to look that up. That means forever. <laughs> in perpetuity. And he wanted the Indiana legislature, if they accepted his offer, to make him a member of the Purdue University trustees for the rest of his life. Well, other people from other locales in Indiana wanted that university too. People from Connorsville and people from Bloomington. Bloomington already had Indiana University. said, hey, we'll just start an ag school. And, and so there was a great deal of animosity about John Purdue. Imagine the ego of that guy who wants to name it for himself and be on the board of trustees. It's hard to believe. And yet John Stein, who was one of the he heroes of my uh, first book, or, or second book, was a state senator at the time, and he put up an impassioned plea for John Purdue and told about all the good things that he is doing and had done and how it would help the university and so on. 
And so the Indiana legislature finally was persuaded to accept the offer. Now we start a board of trustees with John Purdue on it, and they're going to try to organize the university and get it started. And it finally opened in 1874. It took almost five years to get it all started. And John Purdue was a thorn in every side from the things I've read from, from your archives and other places. There are many, many sources to prove what a pain in the rear he must have been in those days. Uh, he would, uh, we wanted to approve the designs of all the buildings and run the courses and decide who the profs were going to be and all the rest of it. And, uh, but, but he got it started and lived for a couple of years until, uh, until it was a little bit underway. But as Bob Topping's great history pointed out in 1988, Purdue had a very troubled beginning. The 1870s and 80s and 90s uh, were low budget, threadbare, argumentative, and uh, there was a big turnover of presidents. They went through about a president a year there for a while. <laughs> And they had faculty people coming and going and all the rest. Well, that was an interesting story to do about John Perdue. And so what happened? After the book comes out, the Midas of the Wabash, press releases go out and all the rest of it. One of the press releases lands in the hands of a young fellow at WBAA, the radio station here at Purdue. Young fellow saw the title, saw that I was in town and could get a hold of me and thought he'd call me and ask me about it. And he said that he understood that uh, John Purdue had started all the uh, Midas brick shops in the community here in those days. He said, no. He said, well, the Midas, of the, uh, the Midas of the Wabash, is that what that meant? I said, no, that means nothing of the kind. You ever heard of Midas? Uh -huh. Yeah. So what are you <laughs> going to do? You just, you take your chances, don't you? Right. You never know what's going to land. Community activities, you got the Tippecanoe County Historical or you've been at John Purdue at the Historical Society, haven't you? Yes. You played John Purdue. And um, also the uh, another program that you've been involved in recently was that James Whitcomb Riley at the Delph at Delphi oh, yeah. Preservation. Yeah. yeah. When the frost is on the pumpkin, you know. There you go. Boy, Purdue had a great practitioner of the Riley Arts, Dr. George Davis. I don't know if uh, mm -hmm. you're familiar with him, but his work back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, he was just a marvelous portrayer of Riley the poet. And uh, I guess I got a recording of some of his tapes, one a recording of some of his performances and got some ideas about how to do them. But George Davis was just outstanding. And uh, so Purdue and Riley and George Davis all had uh, connection. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, now, Lafayette has changed a lot, uh, hasn't it, the infrastructure and the population oh my. over time? Oh, my. And it's hard to believe, you know. I've lived here 65 years. We came here in 1943 to West Lafayette, and then I moved to Lafayette after my marriage in 1957. I never thought I'd live to see the day, first of all, when the Berlin Wall came down. It seemed hopeless. I never thought I would live to see the day when Purdue University would have 30-some thousand students on the West Lafayette campus. It had like 6,000 when I first came here. I never thought I'd live to see the day when the Lafayette City dump over on the east bank of the Wabash River would become a golf course. It's unbelievable. I never thought I'd live to see the day when the railroads were routed outside town and they all go on one route and it doesn't interfere with anybody's driving. Well, we live in a world of miracles and these things do take a lot of time. They do take money, they take effort, they take leadership, but Lafayette has changed so much. The advent of the shopping center is something that's changed Lafayette a great deal. The first one went up in 1952 or somewhere in there. Is that Mark, that mean Market Square, perhaps? That would have been Margine Village, Margin. way out on the east side of Lafayette. That's all been passed over now, and there's city all around it. You were, people have shared with me where Sears was. That was the levee. The dump, there was a dump down there. I mean, yes. People, so that, that's what, the other that, that you mentioned I hadn't heard, but people have talked about that. I mean, yeah, that there was, was a city dump for West Lafayette over on that side, on mm -hmm. Brown Street levee side. Right. Yeah. And then Purdue, uh, or uh, Sears, built there in the 1950s, 54, and operated until it moved out to sure. 
the Tippecanoe Mall in more recent years. But those are just examples of things that all has, I, did, I in, has industry grown to some extent in Lafayette since yes, you've been here. Yes. Alcoa was that be, would that be one of the oldest ones here? Alcoa dates to eight to nineteen thirty seven at the time of the Great Depression, when it was a terrific piece of good news for this community to have a big aluminum plant that's going to hire people. And boy, then when World War II came along, that aluminum plant was hiring more than 3,000 people in the war effort. And so uh, I don't say war is good. I would never say that. But, but economically, it had a big impact. But then there have been many. National Homes Corporation. Their headquarters big, were here. Was big here for a long time. Right. Uh, Great Lakes Chemical had its world headquarters here for a long time. Many General others. General Foods was here for some time. General point. Foods in the 1970s. Right. Caterpillar came in the 1980s. Um, and then what's now known as Tate, Tate and Lyle yeah. became the uh, sugar crop. Wabash process. National, the right. trailer makers became big. One that is sort of, I, I hate to hear this phrase, but it's a good phrase, under the radar. One of the companies here that has been under the radar for years is the Lafayette Venetian Blind Company. It has a huge plant. It's out near Klondike now. Right. <laughs> it's pretty darn good industry. Did it used to be somewhere else? Before yes, it was done? over in Lafayette. I think it was on East Main Street Hill, oh. you know, a little place that had a sign out front. But boy, you know, the opportunities for success are here, and we've enjoyed a good share of them over the years. I've made a number of programs over the years in which I have told people that what we need to appreciate about our community is the balance between manufacturing or industry, Purdue University, and agriculture. Uh, between the farm economy, the Purdue University steadying influence, and, ag and the industrial branch, uh, we don't suffer many really hard times. We have some, like everybody else, but we also have balance so that we don't depend on one thing, like a number of Indiana cities, Marion, Kokomo, Anderson, uh, one horse towns, I don't mean to say that, not one horse towns. One no, industry but, town. One but they depend on one thing more than they need to, and we're fortunate here in that we have another thing about our community that has grown steadily and that I recognize is the importance of the medical community here. Yes, we have a lot of fights over hospitals and over clinics and all the rest of it, but overall the economy really prospers. People come from Illinois and Michigan and to doctors and, and procedures that are done here because of the, uh, the medicine. And, and I just have Purdue's a great contributor to that too. Purdue t teaches a lot of courses for the Indiana University Medical Center. That's right. First and we don't here. The right. cooperation between Purdue and IU far outstrips what happens on a football field. We don't understand that sometimes, and certainly the newspapers would never <laughs> let you guess that, <laughs> would they? But the cooperation's great. Yeah, All right, exactly. Um, a couple of awards and honors I want to ask you about. You got the Lafayette Living Treasure from the historic 9th Street Neighborhood Association. County Historical Association, I think it was, yes. They've only awarded two of those. One went to uh, Mrs. Ball, Evelyn Ball. She was the first one. And she was the first, and I guess I was the second. And it was mostly, from what I've been told and given to read and so on, had to do with the long years of writing about the history of this community and books and columns in the paper and public speaking engagements, which I still give sometimes. I'm going to give another one Thursday to a Purdue group out at the Ross Hills Park. Oh, wonderful. We haven't had a chance to talk much about the Ross Hills uh, book, but that was another of the Purdue books that came out, I think. It's coming out, I guess it is, this, fall, this in, summer. In this process. It's coming sometime. Okay. It's about David Ross, the inventor from Lafayette, and George Aide, the writer, the humorist from up in uh, Kentland and Brook, and how they made Purdue very famous in their separate ways, and then how they came to be friends in the 1920s, and how they pooled their resources, acquired the land, and put up money to get started on the construction of what we know today as Ross Aid Stadium. And one of the parts of that book 
that was fun to do and surprising and an eye-opener for me, and I hope it will be for others, is the vast economic impact that Ross Aid Stadium now has on this community. Every time there's a big football game, a big football crowd, millions of dollars come into this community. The businesses flourish and all the rest of it. It's, that, that's it's one, a magnet. Uh, it's a magnet. It is amazing, and that's one part of the story in that book that I hope someday will come out. Well, it surely will. The other one that you've been inducted in the Indiana Journalism Hall of Fame? Yes. Congratulations. That's very nice. I have a... Were you surprised? In, uh, yes. They, oh. I have a very uh, <laughs> quick answer as to how I got into the Journalism Hall of Fame. I learned how to spell Rensselaer. <laughs> and that wasn't at a spelling bee, right? No, it wasn't at a spelling oh. bee. <laughs> Tell us about your retirement activities. You still do your column. Still do the column once and a week. I, presentations I send it in by email, so that's a lazy man's way of doing columns. And the well, journal, that's the way to do it. You can't. The Journal and Courier some years ago has cut down on the length of stories in an effort to save space and so on, and asked me to cut that column down to about 500 words. And it used to run about 900 words or even 1,000 sometimes if I got really wordy. But I approached that this way. I'm a pro. If you want 500 words, that's what you'll get. If you want it now, I'll give it to you now. If you need it next Wednesday afternoon at 5 o'clock, you'll get it. Count on me. Too many writers nowadays flow at the mouth and, and, and just don't take that discipline seriously. But I've often said over the years, newspaper writing has a lot to do with discipline. One has to do with writing a story to the length that your editor is expecting. Number two, get it turned in on time. Well, some people wait, and, come on, give me the story, give me the story, give me the story, give me the story. And uh, one of the really good writers that we had in our years at the Journal Courier is in the employ of Purdue now, John Norberg. He's been writing speeches for President Jischke over the years. And he's also doing books about Purdue University. But what a grand writer he is and a, a wonderful, a wonderful fellow to know and to work with. But I told John, and I've told him this story many times over, he's not a great speller, okay? John Norberg would admit it. He's not a great speller. He, he'll write a word or a word that make it look like what it sounds like, and if it doesn't, you fix it. When he was a very young reporter at the Journal Courier and I was one of his editors, he did a six-part medical series on the subject of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. He spelled that about 11 different ways in the course of that six-part series. <laughs> and he says, well, one of them's got to be right. <laughs> I'll try all variations, oh, right? Oh, he's a terrific yeah, writer yeah. and a great uh, credit to the university now. How about a favorite, do you have a, a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us? Boy, that's a tough one. I was present at the infamous bleacher crash in 1947 when I believe three people were killed and a number were the wounded Lambert. during a basketball game in what is now the old Lambert Arena or Lambert Fieldhouse. I was lucky. I was sitting opposite. You were, you were there. When it I was there. I was opposite, sitting on the opposite side and saw the whole thing right in front of me. It's an unforgettable sight to see the bleachers start to crash, hear the cracking and splintering and breaking of timber, hear the muffled screams of people who are falling and don't know where to. Uh, that was a sad thing to see, a memorable thing to see. Most people want to know, well, how'd the game turn out? You know, well, I remember that, but I don't remember it very well. Not I think, really. I think Purdue lost by a couple of points, but who cares? They finished the game up in Evanston, Illinois. Who cares? That's uh, not the key thing for that. No, but, but anyway, those are things about Purdue that I do not forget. There's one other that I would share. It has a funny ending and a true ending. John F. Kennedy, the U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, had visited here in 1958. He'd become a President Hubdy's friend. President Hubdy was of Democrat persuasion and kind of wished him well and hoped he could be of help. John F. Kennedy announced for president and came back here in the fall of 1960. 
and was the guest of President Hubby at a Purdue Notre Dame football game over in Ross Ade Stadium. The Hubbies had a reception in his honor in their home over in Lafayette on South 7th Street. Before that game, on a Saturday afternoon, I was invited to come up as a Journal and Courier representative and a chance to talk to Senator Kennedy and President Hubby both. And like a dope, I said to Senator Kennedy, who you going to be for in the football game this afternoon, Senator? And I thought that was a really cool question to ask. Senator Kennedy said, well, as a guest of President Hubby at this lovely reception today, I suppose I should be for Purdue. As a holder of an honorary degree from Notre Dame University, I suppose I should be for Notre Dame. But as a graduate of Harvard, I'm a very poor judge of big time college football. I thought there's a classic answer if there ever was one. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Now, an outstanding event, do you want to share you know, something outstanding event that you'd like to share with, with the researchers comes to mind? That's a tough one. I interviewed Neil Armstrong one time before he landed on the moon. He, here in Lafayette? Here in La Purdue Airport. He and a, a colleague whose last name I momentarily forget had jetted up here from Houston, Texas in about an hour and a half. They were in training down there at the Space Center and came up and I interviewed him for a little while. It wasn't Cernan, was it? They came with May have been Cernan. Oh. I don't remember. Yeah. Somebody was with him. This was in the year 1960. What year was the moon landing? 69. 69. This would have been 68, perhaps. And enjoyed that very, very much. Uh, Neil Armstrong is just a total class act and uh, one for the ages, as the saying goes. Yeah. Any closing comments that uh, you'd like to share with the researchers? Purdue's a great place. Uh, as I told you at the outset, I'm not a Purdue alumnus. I've written about Purdue extensively, I've taught here. Five of our children have got six Purdue degrees all together. Uh, there's nothing that I can say about Purdue that it would be detrimental in any way at all. Uh, long live Purdue. Go Boilers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prebo. I appreciate that.